We're finally here, guys, the eighth and final episode of the greatest season of television ever. We've covered the first seven episodes on our channel. Links are in the description. Time has flown by, and here we are at the motherfucking finale. No time to waste. Let's get into it. So Rust and Marty are holding Geraci as hostage on the boat, trying to get the real story on Marie Fontenot. They make him watch the tape, except he doesn't have gloves on, so his prints are all over it. Marty can't even bear to be there for the tape, so he steps outside. We can hear Geraci screams as the tape plays. Why are you showing me this? After watching the tape, Geraci is also destroyed. He tells the truth. He took a missing juvenile report, but when he went back to follow up on it, the file said report made an error. The sheriff at the time, Ted Childress, was the one who changed the file. Ted is now dead, but he told Geraci that he knew Marie's family, so it's all good. Geraci didn't push back. Later that year, he was in state CID on Ted's recommendation. It's simply chain of command, right? Rust and Marty free Geraci, but not before making some threats to make sure Geraci doesn't go for revenge. Geraci's prints are now on the Marie Fontenot tape. Russ says all their findings are with lawyers. If Geraci tries to get any payback, those findings will be released and Geraci will look guilty as fuck. Rust also tells Geraci that he's already paid for a sniper contract on his head. If Rust or Marty disappear or get in trouble, then the sniper will put Geraci in the dirt. On cue, the bar owner, Dumaine, fires a bunch of shots into Geraci's Maserati to make Rust's point clear. Classic Geraci. We've reviewed his flaws a number of times, but another thing that jumps out about our old buddy during this shot is the presence of the wooden cross on his chest. This probably isn't an accident, it makes for a nice symbol to point out the hypocrisy of the way that people like Geraci use religion as a way to act like they're on the level, while actually remaining ignorant and causing more harm than good within their lives. This isn't true of everybody who's religious, just shitheads like this guy. Considering Geraci's complicity is one of the reasons that the Fontenot case never got legs again, it definitely fits that Geraci would abuse power Power and protect others within that system, like Childress, and ask no questions. Rust's philosophical differences are pretty obvious here. I mean, the dude brandishes his handgun at the very mention of chain of command. Fantastic performance by Michael Hardy in this scene. You can see the remorse in his eyes, even though it is far, far too late. It's chain of command. Right? If we ran a quick fit check here, we'd see that Geraci's rocking some Tommy Bahama ass get up, Marty seems to have raided the old Navy clearance rack, and Rust has on one of the only three outfits he has in the lineup. The boys then do some deep diving into the Tuttle family tree, but they can't find anything on Sheriff Childress. A lot of the hospitals along the coast got wiped out during Katrina, so a ton of birth records are gone. Marty has a moment of intuition though. Back in 1995, there was that little girl who complained of a green-eared spaghetti monster chasing her in the woods. Why were his ears green? Marty digs through old photos from their investigation in 95, and they find a picture of a recently painted green house. Maybe the killer was the one who painted the house. It's a big breakthrough for the boys. With Rust being the ace detective that he is, it is nice to see Marty crack the clue and do some good police work. They pull up to the greenhouse and talk to the residents. It's a younger boy who lives there now, but he says his grandma was living here back in 95. She's now in a nursing facility in Abbeville, so our boys talk to her there. Her memory is surprisingly sharp. She remembers getting her house painted green back in 95, says they were nice men who did a lot of work in the area. Marty asks for any details she can give, and she mentions that they charged 250 bucks for the paint job, and that one of the young men had scars all along his face. Here we go. Russ asks the old lady if she or her husband worked back then, and when she says that her husband did, Russ asks if he paid his taxes. The old lady confirms that her husband was indeed a tax-paying citizen. Classic old lady candy. As somebody who spent a lot of time with his grandparents as a kid, I believe that is a Werther's original hard candy. Yeah, those candies were truly delicious. Anyways, the tax stuff is huge because the husband took the tax write-off for getting his house painted, and using tax records, Russ and Marty find the name of the business that did the painting, Childress and Sons Maintenance. The old lady's memory, as mentioned earlier, is pretty sharp, man. She says the paint job cost $250, and while it actually cost $265, she was pretty fucking close. We learned that Childress and Sons Maintenance first got their business license in 1978 and was started by Billy Childress. However, the license hasn't been renewed since 2004. Rust has Marty run a background check on Billy. Billy Childress was born in Erath in 1944, no records of any sons. An old DMV license shows an address on Highway 27 South. They package all their findings and get ready to send them to the feds and all of the national papers. If in 24 hours the bar owner doesn't hear from Rust, he says to mail all this shit out. Marty then grabs a solo coffee with Papania. He tells Papania that he and Rust are onto something regarding the Lake Charles case, but they can't say anything else. 
When the time comes, they may need backup from Papania and the rest of CID. Does he want the call? As we've learned from Marty's career progression, these type of cases make your career, so getting that call could be super valuable. Marty and Rust are basically setting the case up for Papania and Gilbao to benefit. Papania still doesn't trust Marty and Rust, but obviously wants the call regardless. Give it to me. This back-to-back -back sequence shows us what each detective sees as their contingency plan. Each uses his own style and plays to his own strengths. Rust has always been a fan of the master plan and the complex work that it takes to shine a light on a hidden conspiracy, like the absolute fuckery the Tuttle family tree has spread across the coast. Marty sees a fellow man of the law and works a favor out of him, someone that reminds him a little of a younger version of himself, maybe. Another transition scene that stuck out during the episode was when the two were discussing the incident, quote unquote, back in 02 and Maggie. Out of all the car bits from the show, this one might be the most significant for me. They both start off trying to be nice to each other, but it just devolves into Russ's stubborn philosophies, Marty's insecurity, blame me for what? and some great goddamn one-liners. The problem's with your face, not mine. It's a classic Rust commentary on fate, life, and why he and Marty had both fucked up in the past. To me, it seems like both guys are more or less showing ownership and responsibility, even Marty. His vocab skills need a ton of work, though. What's scented meat? Now all that is left is for Rust and Marty to pull up to the killer's house and grab him. Sounds pretty easy, right? Obviously this is terrifying since they aren't law enforcement anymore so they can't pull up with backup. They find the house in the backwoods of Louisiana. Weeds and tall grass are everywhere. Everything is in shambles. The moment they get out of the car, Rust immediately senses that this is the right place. He tells Marty to call Papania but they can't get a signal. Fuck, that's not good. Marty knocks on the door to go ask to use the phone. As this is happening, we get a view from the killer's perspective, scoping them out from inside the shed. Betty answers the door and tells Marty she doesn't have a phone. Marty cuts right through the bullshit and asks where Billy Childress is. Betty's answer is disturbing. All around us, before you were born. Marty forces himself inside the house. Meanwhile, the dog escapes the house and runs right to the shed, which gives away the scarred man's position. You know what's funny? From an outside perspective, at this point, Rust and Marty are the criminals. They've pulled up onto someone else's property. Marty has broken into their home. Rust has a fucking gun and is chasing one of the residents. Just a different perspective is all. Regardless of who's at legal fault, this is a downright grim setting. Half the property is hidden by trees and it's looking like that creepy ass ranch from once upon a time in Hollywood once Marty busts in. It's just grimy kind of makes you feel dirty just looking at it. Somewhere in the vicinity of Texas Chainsaw and Pearl. So Marty is now in the house with Betty and Rust is chasing the scarred murderer. As Rust goes behind the shed, we see the dog laying dead on the ground. Looks like our scarred man killed the dog to avoid his position being given up. There are terrifying satanic paintings on the walls of the shed, similar to the one found at the abandoned Light of the Way school. We finally see the scarred man standing alone in the fields, staring at Rust. Rust points the gun at him and tells him to get on his knees. Rust will never stop being a cop, I swear to God, man. But our murderer simply isn't having it. No. He takes off and is pretty fucking fast. I'm clocking him at a nice 4'8". For a dude who's looking 6'3", 280, that ain't half bad. In another life, he could have played defensive end at LSU instead. Yeah, on the one hand, it seems incredibly dangerous to pursue a guy with these kind of intangibles. But there is also the fact that Rust has been searching for this guy for basically two decades in a semi-obsessive manner. There is no other option. It's like trying to catch a huge fish if the fish were also a serial killer with multiple personalities, hiding in a series of brick and stone tunnels. The scenery is pushing us toward the Southern Lovecraft feeling that the season has teased here and there. This is going to get messy. Inside the house, Marty is looking for a phone and it's disconnected. The house is so gross, man. Dolls everywhere, papers, trash everywhere. Marty goes upstairs and finds Betty giggling by herself in the corner of the bathroom. He's gonna come for you. It must smell absolutely vile in there. Yeah, I'm really trying not to think about that, to be honest. Meanwhile, Rust is in serious danger and is chasing this guy solo. The chase leads to a massive brick structure. Welcome to Carcosa. The killer is taunting Rust as well. Marty leaves the main house and enters the shed where we see the decaying body of what I believe is Billy Childress. His mouth is sewn shut and he's tied to the bed spring. Fucking nasty as fuck. Marty gets the hell out of there and follows Rust into Carcosa. This fucking place could do some numbers on Airbnb though. Carcosa is completely covered in overgrown vegetation. Devil catchers are everywhere. It looks like a coliseum. 
We get the zoomed out shot showing just how massive the whole structure is. The scarred man is hiding inside and just shouting crazy taunts at Rust, calling him a little priest. Camera work in this scene reminds me a lot of the Stash House raid, and I think it creates some similar feelings. This whole sequence is just adrenaline inducing, man. We hear the scarred man using the echoes of Carcosa to basically tell his life story to Rust. You know what they did to me? Yeah, lesson to all current and future parents watching this, don't abuse your kids. Reggie and DeWall's name get brought up by the Scarred Man as well. I interpret that as Reggie and DeWall being connected to being the plug for the sacrifice ring. In some way, somehow, they end up forming a relationship with this children's cat. Picture the Tuttles and the others as the A-listers in this disgusting ring, and then DeWall Reggie and Childress being definitely lower tier members. Calling them an acolyte is his way of creating or continuing the same type of group or ring that the Tuttle family ran back in the day. This is a copycat kind of guy. He's trying to embody a family tradition that he was never actually fully included in due to his status as an illegitimate son. He also says something here that hints at his previous abuse and why he ended up the way he has. Childress views himself as within the realm of Carcosa and destined or compelled to leave his mark and in turn, a resulting wave of victims, sadly. It seems like he's got a similar recognition toward Rust that DeWall had earlier in the season. You got a demon, little man. Only the title of priest rather than demon seems to show that Rust is on a path toward the light. We started seeing this around mid-season, but there is an odd connection that everybody with the knowledge of Carcosa gets when they're near other people who also have that knowledge. So Carcosa itself is a fucking maze, but it all leads to a main chamber for the rituals. Marty follows and he sees a ton of leftover clothes from children, brutal. He's calling for Rust, but Rust is in too deep and can't hear him. Rust finally makes his way into the main chamber and it's got this massive opening at the top. There's a throne made of sticks and skulls, probably for the Yellow King. Bad time for Rust to have an acid trip flashback because it allows the scarred man to sneak up behind him and put a knife in Rust's stomach. The scarred man is double fisting weapons, he's got the knife in Rust's gut with his left hand and he swings a hatchet with his right hand that Rust blocks at the last second. The size mismatch is too much for Rust though, he lifts Rust off the ground with the stuck knife. Rust is slowly dying but he manages to hit the man with four headbutts in a row to free himself but he's fucking mangled on the ground so it's gonna be curtains for him but Marty arrives just in time and hits the man with the gunshot to the upper shoulder. The man is a fucking tank though and eats the gunshot and Tomahawk throws the hatchet into Marty's chest. He stomps Marty in the face and pulls the hatchet out of his chest. As he's swinging for the kill shot, Rust lands a headshot on the man while lying on the ground, bleeding out from his stomach. They did it! But things are really bad. Rust is in seriously bad shape and losing a fuck ton of blood. You can make the argument that this was a suicide mission from the jump for Rust. He wanted this dude dead at all costs and was clearly about ready to wrap his own journey too. Sure hope that old lady was wrong. About what? That death not being the end of it. Rust moves are straight out of WWE SmackDown. Are you kidding me? And they bought just enough time for the boys. It is fitting that Marty is the one standing, or sitting, at the end. He's finally made good on his debt. Rust is staring down the gates of purgatory as we speak. His connection to Carcosa and what drew him into the circle that Childress occupied is fairly abstract, but there's gotta be a connection to the vision he experienced and the shift in the energy he felt on the property. So before we get into the aftermath, let's talk more about the Scarred Man, the murderer, who we learn in the episode is named Errol Childress. The opening fucking scene of the episode has Errol talking to his dad. Seems pretty normal, right? Except his dad is obviously dead and tied up in the bed. The flies are buzzing and picking him apart. The house, as mentioned earlier, is grimy AF. The only inhabitants of the murder compound are Errol and this woman named Betty, who we later find out is his half-sister. Errol seems to have multiple personalities. When he's with Betty, he has this posh English accent. Betty seems to be disabled, could be due to the inbreeding. Anyways, Errol pleasures Betty and ends up adopting another personality with a deeper, slower voice when he asks about Grandpa. Couldn't you tell me about Grandpa? And Betty proceeds to tell a story of Errol's grandpa raping her in the cane fields. What the fuck, dude? Where to start? 
Based on what we know about him, his habit of accent switching is definitely a deeper sign of his struggle to occupy a true identity. Notice that he picks it up from the television show he's watching just seconds before. I mean, we've all quoted TV shows before in an effort to either be funny or to connect to other people, but this seems like a different level. One theory on this dynamic is that he craves to belong to the Tuttle slash Childress family tree in such a way where he sees this damaging vile behavior like rape and pedophilia as a connection to those in his familial past that he wishes to be more like or that he wants to be accepted by my family's been here a long long time we get this other scene with errol where he's painting a local school very bad to have this predator hanging around children during recess the kids run out to play and errol is just staring at them and basically sweating the teacher is this attractive woman and she offers to bring errol a lunch he has no interest in her a young boy walks over and locks eyes with errol and the whole thing is just very uncomfortable he built his entire operation off of patterns. Like many serial killers or predators, this is simply one of them and it's a little hard to watch. One last note on this death, this means that the guy who played Errol has officially been killed by Matthew McConaughey, Woody Harrelson, along with his previous deaths at the hands of Bill Hader and Joaquin Phoenix. That's a pretty good list. All right, back to the episode progression. Now that Errol is dead, reinforcements finally arrive. I'm assuming Marty was able to get a phone and call for help while Russ was battling in Carcosa. Papania and Gilbao arrive with the entire squadron. These two fuckers just had their careers made. We flash forward to Marty laying in a hospital bed talking to Papania and Gilbao. They confirm everything that Russ and Marty knew. The scarred man Errol Childress was Billy's son. The woman was his half-sister. The knife he used to stab Rust matches Dora Lang's wounds. This dude kept that knife for nearly 20 years. The knife also matched the Lake Charles murder as well. Marty asks about Russ and it turns out that he's still in a coma, not surprising. Marty does get a surprise visit from Maggie and his daughters. At first he's pumped to see them, but then the emotions of everything hits him and he breaks down. Marty's a flawed man, not an ideal family man, but damn it, he's brave as fuck and he is a hero. He just settled down too early and never truly knew himself. Lots of repressed emotions expressed here. Good for you, Marty. It's loaded. The family he nearly destroyed is by his side because in some way they still do care for him. He's also slowly processing what he experienced at the Childress residence and within Carcosa. This is not the man we once knew, but that's probably a good thing. Everybody changes. So the killer's name finally gets released to the public, full name Errol William Childress. The state attorney general and the FBI end up refuting rumors that Childress was related to Louisiana Senator Edwin Tuttle. The rich powerful fuckers keep getting away man, setting up something for season 4 baby. They only managed to expose the bottom rung of the operation, but at least there's some justice for victims, and they kept a few more bad guys from the door. Towards the end, we get good news as Russ finally wakes up from his coma, looking like absolute dog shit. Marty rolls up in a wheelchair, drinking from a straw. Immediately, these two just start talking shit to each other again. Russ is pissed at himself, because he remembers seeing Errol in the schoolyard in 95 outside of the Light Away school, and he missed him because he was sitting down and his face was dirty, so he didn't look like the tall, scarred man. Rust is also pissed that Tuttle and the others in the Fontenot video are going to get away with this. Another middle finger update, even on the brink of death, these two fight like an old married couple. The camera shots we get of the significant settings during the case was a nice bookend. The bit of frustration from Rust is connected to his ego, but also, I get it. The show did a nice job of hiding his dirtbag in plain sight and Rust nearly had the system beat. Nearly. Some more time passes and Marty is now fully healed and walking. He wheels Rust out of the hospital and hands him a pack of cigs as a gift. Rust is technically still supposed to be in the hospital, but he doesn't give a fuck and wants to leave now. He tells Marty about the things he saw while in a coma, and boy are these things life-changing for Rust. When he was under, he could feel himself fading and slipping away into a deeper, warmer darkness. He could feel his daughter waiting for him on the other side. He could feel his dad there too. He just felt an overwhelming amount of love. Russ wanted to let go and be with his daughter, but then he woke up. For the first time in their relationship, Russ is showing true vulnerability to Marty. Marty and Russ talk about the stars, and Russ mentions life always comes back to one story, the oldest story, light versus dark. When Marty looks at the sky and says it looks like the dark has more territory, we get a profound answer from Russ that shows that his entire outlook on life has changed. I want to say it's only dark. Yeah, it's getting lights, 
Jesus, have you ever seen a bigger 180? Part of what happened here is that Rust gained more perspective on his previous experiences, which colors his experiences as more meaningful than depressing and dark like he believed in the past. He went from being a bitter nihilistic pessimist to a born again borderline optimist. I'm not gonna say he's totally out of the woods yet, but he does seem much more capable of happiness. We might put him in the category of not religious, but maybe a little spiritual at this point. I'm glad he got to experience that connection with his daughter and father again. Two people that were mentioned frequently along his journey for better or worse. Funny moment when Marty has no clue on how to respond to Rust, so he goes with a classic awkward shoulder touch. The guys are heading in the right direction and time is still a flat circle. The Tuttle's not being impacted much by this was a rough outcome, but the notion of the world as a truly bleak place has shifted. There's a little more meaning to the world now. Hell of a season. Cannot wait to watch it again in a year. Thank you. Well that does it. We finally finished season one of True Detective. As they say, all good things must come to an end, but psych! Motherfucking season four is starting up soon, and you know me and Damon are about to break that shit down as well, so let's keep this fucking party going. Pass me a Red Bull.